Welcome. My name is Morgan McCollum, and I'm with the Oregon Society of Artists, and we're here today to talk to Teresa Saya, who is offering an online workshop from April 9th to the 11th entitled Expressions in Light and Pastels. We're excited to talk to Teresa today, and I hope you enjoy it. Hi, very nice to meet you, Teresa. It's been a pleasure. Nice to, to meet you, Morgan. Teresa is a pastelist. Is that is that the proper term? Yeah, I I, I go by pastelist. I do about thirty percent of my work in oils, but um, and a little bit actually in acrylic. But I'm really known uh, at this time for my pastels. In fact. Uh, before I got into pastels, I was a professional watercolor artist for 15 years oh. and did very well with that. But when it came to um, really wanting, I, I think I saw a, a couple of pastels that friends had uh, done. And I was like, oh my gosh, this, the, the impact of it was just fabulous. So um, texture, uh, depth of color, um, just the the vibrancy because of the pastels themselves, um, the makeup of pastels themselves. So that's how I really. Um, I know that on one of your videos on your website, you had talked about the changes to pastels over time and the makeup of pastels has changed significantly. Could you speak a little bit to that? Well, the, the wonderful things about pastel are, I mean, professional pastels, is that they are pure pigment with a small amount of binder to hold them into sticks, right? So it's called, most museums still call it a drawing medium. I tend to say that I paint with pastels, but, um, but anyway, so the fact that it's pure pigment, it's pure crystals of pigment, finely ground up um, and made into sticks. So when it sits on the surface of the paper, the light refraction qualities are just superb. And people, you know, when they first see my work, they go, how do you, how do, you do this? How do you get this wonderful vibrancy? And it's really the pastel. Okay. It's, it's what pastel, how pastel is made. The other thing that's really, in a, as far as a renaissance in pastel right now is the fact that we have several um, homemade or handmade pastels uh, in the United States, as well as England. And those are just fabulous. So Terry Ludwig is one of them, Blue Earth are beautiful. Diane Townsend is another one. So all of that, the quality is wonderful. Now, when Sennelier first started making pastels in France for the Impressionists, they were fabulous too. They were pretty much pure pigment with a little bit of binder in them. What's really been wonderful about the pastel medium now is that we have, the technology has, <laughs> has grown up, right? And the paper that we use now it's a very expensive paper. It's a, typically a sanded finish. Most artists use that. Some artists still use the Canson paper or Mi Tiente. Um, but this sanded paper is uh, museum quality archival and it holds layers and layers of the pastel. Does that stop the necessity to use the pastel ground? Do you have to put the ground on your paper first when it's sanded paper or, or is it just? No. Go ahead. No. Right. Yeah, so some people do make their own ground and it is um, usually like marble dust mixed with other things. And it's, it's a paste that you can paint on paper to make your own pastel paper. And it's a very, it's pretty gritty. It's a little bit more gritty than the paper that I typically use, which is UART. And um, I believe it's made in Germany. The UART paper is made in Germany. And the other paper that I really like is Sennelier's Le Carte, which is a sanded finish, but it doesn't take any water medium. If you put water on it, the, the, 
the sanded finish will just lift off of the paper. Where you art paper, I can use acrylics on it. I can put wash, watercolor, whatever, which is what I typically do as an underpainting before I start. But I wanted to get back to the technology. So one more aspect of the technology is that we now have um, museum quality glass. So we have museum quality is like 97% UV protection. And then it's a non-reflective glass. So it has a film on it, but it's wonderful because when a painting is properly hung and lit, it's like there's no glass on it. So oh, nice. those, are, those are things that have really helped pastels. And I, I think that they help sell pastels. So this is an important fact. So a lot of people feel as though um, pastels will fade and they really, they're pure pigment. So as long as they're not in direct sunlight, they're not, they're not going to fade. Um, yeah, it's, it's, they are, they do have to be under glass. Yes. But um, being a pure pigment, they hold up, you know, very well over the test of time. The, um, this is an interesting fact that's important. So you go into the museums, whether it's in New York or Paris or the Tate in London, and you see the impressionist pastels in this very low light situation. Um, and the reason is not the pastels being fugitive, but the surface that they painted them on was full of acids. And so the paper itself deteriorates with the UV, not so, not so much the pastels, it's, it's the paper that has created um, the need to keep them in a low light situation. Also, I know that when you spray pastels to, um, to fix, you fix the pastel, um, that they darken a lot. Do you have any way of getting around that? Or is there a certain product that you use to where they don't darken or which? The, the only spray, that I use, and it's only when I finish the painting, is called Lasco. And I think I have some right here. Here's, here it is, Lasco. So this is, whoop, here we go. This is what I use, Lasco fixative. It's from Switzerland and it's just superb. I mean, uh, it does not alter the color, does not alter the light. Uh, in the painting at all, which of course is really important. Um, a lot of fixatives will just kill back all the, the refraction quality in those pastel crystals. So this is the, my, this is my go-to. It's the only one that I use. So did you always want to be an artist or did you have other ambitions when you were young? You know, I, I don't think, um, my, I mean, I was taken to museums as a child a lot. And I loved paintings, but for some reason, I didn't go in that direction for a while. I loved cooking. So, um, I, you know, my mom was a great cook and she had, she probably had the first Julia Child's cookbook. You know, we probably were the first in our block in our neighborhood, at, you know, and so I would cook all these meals and do all these wonderful, fancy things that I loved growing up. The other thing is I sewed. So I loved to design my own clothes. And my mom, I was the only girl with four brothers. And my mom said, hey, you know what? I will teach you how to sew. I will take you to the store and teach you how to pick beautiful materials and all of that. And um, so that was really my creative edge for a while. In the seventh grade, I had an amazing, oh, I took my first art class, right? And it was um, in the, in the, within the school district. And I loved it. We were painting in acrylics, of course, um, and doing still lifes. And my teacher loved my painting so much that she says, can I keep this? I would really like to keep this for a while and whatever. Well, you know, uh, Christmas break came, whatever. She never returned to school. She had a stroke and, and never was able to teach again. So Aww. after, so I didn't get back into painting again until really when I was in my late twenties. 
later 20s, I was learning how to, um, I had gone back to school and to college and um, was taking business and language courses and uh, started taking drawing. And I did a lot of calligraphy. So calligraphy happened, then the drawing happened. So I started selling work with calligraphy and drawings on it. And then I had a mentor that said, hey, you know what? You should learn how to paint. And so I had this push to uh, go and take, and I, I actually found uh, a wonderful person in the Santa Clara Valley area of California that taught us. And so I went into watercolor because I thought that would work well with the calligraphy and the paper that I would use. So, and then I just had one mentor after another that um, just kept pushing me along and, and I loved it. It was painting really as uh, Frida Kahlo says, what does she say? Painting completed my life, art completed my life, right? Um, so I just never stopped after that. I, you know, would go from studying with this person to that person. I never got an art degree because I lived on Whidbey Island at the time. And I, I didn't want to spend the time to go over to UW or whatever. So whenever anybody was in the area, I would study under them and just continue to grow and paint and paint and paint and paint. So it wasn't something that I did, um, you know, two days a week. I did it five days a week, you know. Well, they say so it takes 10,000 hours of doing anything to become good at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I, I think as artists, we all want to rush to the end product <laughs> and become, <sighs> things, you know, the, the best that oh. we can be. And it just doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, right. the magic wand, it's just practice and, and work. <laughs> yeah. One of my main thing, uh, little speeches when I teach is that to enjoy the process, really not to feel as though the end result has to be so good yeah. that you're really learning and exploring every time you paint and to not get so wound up into, is this going to turn out? Is this going to turn out? Is this going to turn out? Really think about what you're enjoying, take your time, stand back and look at the painting as a whole. Yeah. And, and sometimes they're not going to be what you want them to be, but every time you learn something new, you know, that, that this color looks amazing against this color. And I'm going to use that again, or, you know, those are all things that you carry with you in your briefcase of tricks, you know, to, to make a better painting the next time and the next right. time. That. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's so wonderful to study with different people because, and bring what you learn from there back to your studio and in, in envelop that into what you are already doing. So it's not as though, um, when I was taking workshops a lot, um, I would come back and work and work. And that's how you obtain your own style. People say, how, how, do, how do you style? And when I teach, I can see people already have a style. By the time they're on their third painting, I'm like, no, you have a style. You have a direction, you have, uh, something that's unique to you. Uh, I love the fact that with pastel, you know, how you make your mark, it's just like painters and how they use that brush and how they manipulate that. That's your signature. How you hold that pastel, how you handle it um, is different for everybody. I mean, it really is physical element to to painting that I think is overlooked a lot of times you know we talk about darks against lights to make things pop and composition and the rule of odds and all these things but I, I think one of the things that's con that's pretty consistently overlooked in classes is how you hold your material I noticed uh, when I was taking an oil class from um, Michael Orwick the another OSA instructor that he would almost, he would hold the brush upright and almost pet the canvas. That was a huge breakthrough for me because I was like, oh, I always hold it like this, you know, and of course you're getting more resistance. So you're pulling the paint thinner and he right. would just pet that canvas. And I was like, well, that's just amazing. I and just scumble I the paint over the top. Yes, just right. scumble the paint. Yeah. And 
no that was like amazing that was and and that's why these classes are so valuable because i feel like you you find those little tips and it's like you know you get this giant light bulb above your head and you're like why did i never even consider that before i don't know <laughs> right yeah no it is it's i think uh taking workshops is just so valuable because you're getting outside of your comfort zone and trying something new and it i i just think it's it's good i think it's good because you know if you're just focused on one thing and you you find something that works da 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 da, da and that's fine for a while but you've got to keep on growing i mean i feel like i want to grow and learn more until they put me in my grave. I had some great mentors here on the island that were, these ladies were probably in their 80s, mid 80s. And they, they, were, they were wonderful, I wanna say kick ass, but, but um, they were just great. And they would like scoop me up and say, we're gonna go take this workshop here. And um, oh my gosh, I mean, they were just fabulous. And I'm thinking, Oh, if I make it to 85, I want to be there too. It was, yeah. I know you worked with lots of mediums and, um, and I, I would assume that you, when you do use watercolor or acrylic, now you're using them as an underpainting in your pastels primarily. Um, what right. primarily I have been doing some, a couple of acrylic paintings lately. Um, and I've enjoyed that. And I, really went to that more than oil just because I felt as though I could accomplish what I needed that way. But really my main go-to is the pastels. Yes. And, and, and I do do it. I do do an underpainting. I don't like working on white paper or this um, UART comes in like an off uh, white paper, but it's, it's wonderful. UART is a great paper. It comes in a roll so I can paint as big as I want to paint. I'm doing a commission right now that's 42 by 80. So, oh. you know, for pastel, that's large. That is very large. That's amazing. And uh, what makes pastels your preferred medium? What about it do you love? Wow. It just, it helps me say what I want to say. You know, take a subject matter take a landscape, take something that I found, you know, on my wa daily walk with my dogs, whatever. I feel like, wow, I can, that I can translate into pastel. It helps me say and create the mood that I want to, to say. Now I do do oils and with my oils, I would have to say I'm much more tonalist. Um, so color, but really more toned down. So more of a tonalist, um, look there and i like that uh kind of old you know i, I love george and s and um you know that whole group of painters that called themselves you know a luminous mm -hmm. so it's more of an inner glow from their paintings so i still want that in my oil paintings but the color is subdued somewhat what do you think artists can do that will best help them move forward in their progression as an artist? Wow. You know, it's just like you live the life, you know, you're painting, you're doing some painting, finding some time to paint, you know, every day, a little sketch, um, you know, always, um, you know, reading about other artists, um, you know, finding an artist that you really admire and, and finding out what, you know, the background to this artist and, and um, you know, studying that and, you know, it, it taking workshops really, it does help. Um, as long as you go back and you work on, on what you are. So many people, you know, they'll take a workshop from me, they loved it, and then they come back a year later and take another workshop. But in between, they they didn't have the time or or weren't able to like set up an area. So first of all, I think you have to set up an area. Uh, it doesn't have to be a large area. It could be a corner of a room where you've got your lighting set and you can put out your things, put out your easel and be able to just go in there at any time that you have a break from life 
and and paint something because you know i i love it i'm trying to remember which artist it was um that wrote that oh darn he's marvelous um oil and pastel painter but he said you know you're worried about what you're going to be painting and if how's it going to turn out whatever and you're looking at this blank canvas or this piece of paper or whatever five minutes into the painting you're lost you're lost in the painting so it's just getting yourself to do it and i think you know repetition um you know working on something maybe a series of something too um and always carrying around like the phones these days are so amazing you know i use the um the iphone pro max whatever with the three cameras and i just carry it everywhere with me and when i see that hint of light on the trees just hitting it so beautifully and creating that glow i mean i'm like snapping pictures for references yeah. and um i can't tell you how many photos i have on my phone but it's a lot but the the other thing is is taking those images and a lot of times cropping them down to make it much simpler as far as um not so you're not taking in the whole landscape you're really focusing in on what catches your eye and working on that and maybe not just doing one painting doing two or three paintings in a different color combination different value shifts on it whatever but um the main thing is having a space in your life that you can go to when you have time and get it done because even even painting half an hour 45 minutes a day it's it's going to help yeah i completely agree do you have a book <clears throat> that you read that was just very inspirational for you or that really spoke to you as far as like your learning process as an artist wow if i showed you my library <laughs> yeah. right back there um <laughs> I mean, there's so many books and, and I'll come back. Okay. There is one book that I recommend for anybody that's going to be painting landscape. Right. Um, and it's George Carlson's John Carlson book of landscape painting. Okay. And it's absolutely fabulous. I will, I was going to study with a very top notch artist in, uh, Santa Fe. And she said, I don't come to my class until you have read this book, oh. you know, start to finish. And so I had had the book for a couple of years and on the plane, I read the book, right? <laughs> and I'm like, oh my gosh, it has everything, you know, all the landscape books that are made these days, follow off on his landscape book. And it was from the like 1917 or 1920 or something. Oh, goodness. And it's black and white, but um, it's fabulous. Wow. The the other ones, you know, I mean, the Schmidt books for oil painters or pastelists are fabulous because there's just so much Richard Schmidt's books. Okay. Um, I love as far as uh, pastel. Um, when I was first starting pastel, Doug Dawson's book. I I don't know if it's still in print, but Doug Dawson, it's. I think it's the only book he put out um and that book was fabulous um as far as handling whether it was the figure or whether it was a night scene a city night scene or a landscape but um he was, he's a he's a lovely man um and r wonderful wonderful teacher i mean he's just so patient and so knowledgeable oh that's fantastic um do you feel like there were beliefs that you had to give up in order to become a professional artist? Wow, negativity, <laughs> self-doubt. I mean, it, it, you try to give it up, but I mean, it's just one of those things that the 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 passion and the um, the joy I got from painting just um, really helped. You know, to be a professional artist, you need to be structured. You need to get yourself 
in the studio, you know, every day or five days a week doing your thing. So um, having, a, having a structure and, and really letting your family and friends know that this is my time, right? Uh, I think that's a big things I had to give up was really, and it was, it was good anyway. What type of artist do you think could best benefit from learning pastels? I think that any artist would benefit from trying it, right? Um, a lot of, I mean, pastel is a very unique medium, um, you know, because you have these sticks and you're not really mixing. So watercolor, acrylic, oils, you're mixing. And with pastel, you're really layering to get the certain effects that you do. Um, and a lot of times I won't, I'm not a blender. A lot of people blend pastels. I'm really not a blender. I would rather take a stick with maybe the same value, but a different color note and put that next to the mark that I'm making. Um, but I, I, I think anybody can, can uh, enjoy and grow with pastel. I mean, I in, I enjoy doing different mediums because I think it keeps me sharp. And when I'm working on a on an acrylic painting, I'm already I'm still thinking about oh how can I do what I just did there in my in my pastel, and yeah. and vice versa. Well, and it just gives you different ways of working too. And you realize that some of those skills, even if you decide not to become a pastelist as your main um, uh, medium. I think that every time you learn something in a different medium, you, there's always things you can transfer to your right to the. Mm -hmm. But I, I think you really trying it and seeing it. The first couple of times I tried pastel, I was like, I, or I would take like a one day workshop and I would be fine in the workshop, right? And then I go back to my studio and it was like a big mess, right? And so learning like any like any medium there's a learning curve in really um learning how to handle the medium properly so that you're getting the effect that you want um Great. that's a that's a big thing but yeah the first couple of tries at it i was like oh oh this is messy um but when i did the third workshop and I can't remember his name. Oh, he was so spectacular as an instructor. He instilled this, this energy in the room that you can do it and you bring out you in this painting. So just go for it, right? I mean, he, he talked about the values and lighting structure and, and the basic process of getting through a pastel, but he exuded this gift to all of us of, of really letting go and just going for it. Oh. And I mean, I just, I came out of there going, oh, wow, this is, <laughs> this is wonderful, right? <laughs> great feeling, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it, it really is. And, you know, that's such a gift, you know, for um, an instructor to really um, empower that person to move forward in, in what they're doing. And, um, you know, I, I think it's important when I start a workshop that I really kind of go through each of the students, say hello, and ask them what they really would like to gain from this workshop. Because a lot of the people are quite good already, right? Some of them are more beginners. Um, and some of them are even other professionals that are taking the workshop, but um, helping them, help, helping to know how and what, or really what they are looking for to move forward. What, what can I give them to move forward? And they usually have something in specific, but uh, knowing that from each person really helps me um, in directing them really how to get there. Um, the other thing that really, <laughs> when I first started um, 
painting and I would take workshops and they'd say, okay, we're going to do a value study. And I was like, oh no, a value study. That's just so boring. I just want to paint. And um, so finally, when I did go to little thumbnails, just little thumbnails, just taking what you're doing and put, simplifying the shapes and values into maybe three values and simplifying the shapes. The reason that really helped me as well as them is that I then know what they took out of this whatever photo or, or uh, scenery that they were working on, right? And I could then know, okay, this is their vision of what they want to do. It's been just a pleasure to talk to you and clearly have a lot to offer in terms of teaching. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Morgan. And I'm really looking forward to doing the workshop and painting with the people down at uh, Oregon Society of Artists.